Hey, good morning. Uh, hey, I'm Adam. If you don't know me, I'm one of the pastors here. Really glad you're here. Uh, a study was done a few years ago at the University of Virginia where it was published in the Journal of Experimental and Social, Psych Social Psychology. And basically what they did is they set up on a flat spot next to a hill and they had students come by and guess how steep the hill was. And so one by one, they came by. They first, they tested individuals to say and ask them how steep the hill was. And then they, they tested people who were with a friend. And when they tested people with a friend, their friend had to stand three feet away. Their friend, they couldn't talk to their friend. And uh, what they found was, and you guys are smart, so you guys probably can already guess what they found. But they found that people who were with a friend, even though that friend was three feet away and couldn't talk to them, they estimated the hill to be 10 degrees less steep than people who were alone. And in other words, challenges look less challenging when you're not alone. And life looks worse when you are alone. And here's the thing, I, I think that many of you this morning can feel often like you are alone in the Christian life. You are, you're looking out, you're like the only Jesus follower in your entire family. Or you're the only Jesus follower at your workplace. Or you, you know, you're the only parent on your kid's soccer team that cares at all about your kid coming to church and you have to like wrestling with do they miss the tournament or not, right? You're the only one, you're like, you go to the coffee shop that you're always at and you realize you're the only one with the Bible out on the table again, right? And I, you know, and I know, we know it's not normal to follow Jesus, especially not normal to follow Jesus in the Bay Area, right? There's not that many of us around. And when you begin to live your brand new life in Christ, right? We've been talking about this brand new life that we live in Christ as we work through the book of Colossians. Uh, it can feel like, if you feel like you're alone in this, if you feel like you've got to live this brand new life by yourself, it will look desperate, dark, and hopeless. It'll feel like that hill is a whole lot steeper. But in Colossians 4, in our passage this morning, if you've got a Bible, you can turn there. We're in Colossians chapter 4 today. Uh, Paul urges you and I to remember that you are not alone. You're not alone. You've got some other people standing with you at the bottom of the hill. And we got to remember, Colossians was written to a group of Christians in this city that they were it. They were the only Christians in the whole city. They, there were even fewer Christians in their city than are in ours. And so as we finish up the book of Colossians today, he's reminding them and he's reminding us that you are not alone. You know what? You go ahead and tell someone near you. Tell, tell your neighbor, you are not alone. Go right now, turn to your neighbor, tell him you are not alone. Good. That's good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just gotta know. All right, now turn, turn to your other neighbor because your other neighbor also, your other neighbor needs to know they're not alone too. So go ahead and yeah, there you go. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, awesome. So and in, our, in our passage, Paul, Paul kind of turns around and he says, listen, there's five kind of habits that stem from knowing you're not alone as a believer. Five habits and mature Christians do consistently what others do only occasionally. And so these really are habits. And so what I want to do this morning is just kind of walk through them. We're going to move through them pretty quick. But uh, the first one is, Paul says, to devote yourselves to others hearing the good news. When you feel like that hill is insurmountable, it's tempting, it's really tempting to turn in on yourself and to think about all how bad your life is or how hard things are. But when in those moments, it's critical to remember that there are other people around you that God is calling to. And so look with me at verses two, two through six. In chapter, again, we're in Colossians chapter four, the words will be up on the screen here too. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should, and be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now this whole section is about how to, uh, how to interact with people who don't believe the gospel. And in these final instructions, Paul tells us to devote ourselves to prayer. And specifically, we're supposed to pray, Paul asked the Colossians to pray that a door would be open for the message of the gospel. 
about the, the, the message of the good news about Jesus, that it would be opened up, that they would proclaim the truth, that, that Paul would have opportunities to proclaim the truth, that Jesus died on the cross for the sin of all people who believe in him, no matter what their background and no matter what their history. And I don't, about, I don't know about you, but when things get bad in my life, I always pray that God would make those things better. Right? Don't you pray that? Like things get bad in your life. I just pray that God would make things better. God would fix the situation. But that's not what Paul prays for. Because remember, Paul's writing from prison. So Paul is literally sitting, probably staring at a locked prison door as he writes these words. And he doesn't ask the Colossians to pray that the door would be open for him so that he could get out of prison. He asks that a door for the message of the gospel would be opened, which is a very different request. And, uh, and I've got this good buddy of mine, really good friend of mine, that uh, he's got this job that he absolutely hates. Just an awful job. He, it's exhausting. It's not what he went to school to do. Uh, but this guy has just made the most of his situation. And he has consistently, for like a number of years now, consistently and boldly and faithfully shared the gospel with his coworkers. And he's seeing fruit from that. Like people are coming to faith. People are coming there and... Because, and here's the deal, he cares more that the door for the message of the gospel would be opened in his life than the back door would be opened so he can escape from this job he doesn't like. And if you begin to pray for this, if you begin to pray in your life that the door to the message of the gospel would be opened for you, I can, I can almost guarantee that is a prayer that God is gonna answer. I know I don't know if he's going to get you out of your job. I don't know if he's going to get you out of the hard thing you're in, but I know he's going to bring some people in your life that he's going to open the door for you to share with them. And so what do you do in the meantime, or what do you do uh, when he does? Paul says that you should be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity you have to interact with these people. These folks in your life, they're not gonna read a Bible. They may not even have a Bible. They're not gonna pray. They're not gonna come listen to some preacher get up and talk at them, right? But they, what they are gonna do is they're gonna see how you live. They're gonna see how you act. They're gonna see what your attitude is like when things go wrong. They're gonna see how you treat other people in your life. And they're gonna form their judgment about Jesus based on the only person that they know who knows Jesus, you. And, and so Paul says, be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. But not only how you act, also how you speak. Paul says, let your conversation be seasoned with grace. Like you season food with salt. You put salt on everything because it makes, it makes it taste better and it's super unhealthy, right? You put salt on everything. You season everything with salt no matter what. He says, no matter who you're talking to, no matter who you're talking about, no matter what circumstances you're talking about, your, your speech should be full of grace, right? We are people of grace. We've received the grace of Jesus. It's undeserved. And so when we speak about our families, or about your boss, or about your friends, or your enemies, or your political opposites, or your circumstances. Your conversation should be full of grace. Because if we speak about grace, with, about everything in our lives, and to and about everyone in our lives, when it comes time, when the opportunity comes up that we've been praying for to share the truth of the gospel, we will do so with grace. We'll do, it'll just be natural. And so I would encourage you this week, Paul or uh, Rob, Rob mentioned it, right? Like this is the week that more people are open to coming to church and exploring spiritual things than almost any other week all year long. Like, so this week, start pray that a door to the message of the gospel be opened in your life. And maybe it means you get to, maybe it means you invite someone to church on Sunday or on Saturday or on Friday um, this next weekend, or, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it means you just invite them over for dinner. But I would I, think about who you might invite or who, and who might God be calling you to? Who might God be opening that door for in your life? Uh, so second, Paul says that you need to remind yourself that you're not alone by listening to stories of other Christians in other places and God working in other places. So as Paul closes his letter, he actually sends his, some of these stories along to the Colossians of the work that God is doing in other parts of the Roman Empire, especially in Rome. And so if you'll look with me at 
verses seven to nine, this is what Paul says. He says, Tychicus will tell you all the, thing, all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who's one of you. And they will tell you everything that is happening here. You see, in the ancient world, paper wasn't readily available. It was pretty expensive. And so Paul didn't write down everything he wanted to tell them. He just wrote down some of it. And instead, he sent a letter with a man named Tychicus. They didn't have USPS. They had Tychicus. And so uh, <laughs> Tychicus was one of his fellow partners, fellow church planters. who has been around Paul, doing the work with Paul in Rome. And so he sends him with this letter so that Tychicus could tell the Colossians everything that was going on with Paul. And I don't know what the full report said. Apparently, though, despite the fact that Paul was shackled behind a prison door, something about his circumstances were immensely encouraging to the Colossians. And my guess is, based on you know, some other letters Paul wrote and some other things Paul wrote, is that Paul had been able to share the gospel with a whole bunch of people in, the, in and around the prison. The Roman guards were accepting Christ, and maybe even some of the own emperor's family was accepting Christ and believing in Jesus precisely because Paul was in prison. And so rather than prison stopping the advancement of the gospel, it was actually propelling the advancement of the gospel, and this was encouraging the hearts of the Colossians. And in addition to Tychicus, he also sent back another man named, a native Colossian named Onesimus. And we know from another letter Paul wrote, Onesimus was actually a runaway slave. And he'd run away, he'd come to Paul, he would believed in Jesus, and now Paul is sending him back. And he doesn't describe him as a slave, instead he describes him as our faithful and dear brother who's one of you. His status as a slave is unimportant. What matters is his status as a brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul gives him this task to do as he goes, to tell the Colossians everything that is happening in Rome, that everything that God is doing in Rome. And so again, Paul wants the Colossians to know they're not alone. In their little city, it maybe felt like God was not working, like God wasn't doing anything, like they were this small little insignificant group in this whole big city. And I don't know, maybe sometimes you feel this way. But the Colossians should feel encouraged because of the, there are stories of the gospel's advance in other places, and we should be too. Right? So when it feels like you're alone, like God isn't working, like God isn't moving here, he is moving here. It's important for you to listen to stories of people coming to faith. That's why next week and, uh, on Easter, when we're going to baptize some folks, and before we baptize them, we're going to get them up here on stage, and they're going to they're going to talk about how they came to believe in Jesus. Because we think it's important for you to hear their stories and be encouraged by their stories. It's it's why you know we uh, we need to hear stories all over the Bay Area and all over the world. We why we read biographies of Christians from the past. So what I want to do now is we're going to show, I'm going to show a quick video of one of our global outreach partners. This is the guy Vince. He lives in uh, Italy and Sicily doing work with, I don't know if you know, this is a huge refugee crisis you've probably heard. And so there's tons of people streaming across the Mediterranean and landing on the shores a lot in Italy and in Sicily. And so Vince is on the ground there with an organization and they're meeting these people, these tired, broken, hungry hurting people, and they're, they're uh, meeting their tangible needs and sharing the gospel with them, and it's really powerful. I'll let him tell you more about it. Hey, hi, dear friends. This is Vince and uh, Ryan from Sicily in the middle of the Mediterranean, and we'll just give you a, a little snapshot of what we're doing here now. I'm not the leader. Ryan is. He's a, a project leader over the uh, number of families who are here in the Catania area in Sicily. And Ryan, can you tell our folks, our dear folks in the uh, San Francisco area at New North, what we're doing here? Well, hi, New North. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we've we got a project going on here. We've got seven families here in the Catania area. Um, over the last several years, we've had maybe almost as, million, as many as a million people that have uh, that have landed here coming from places uh, that, that have no access to the gospel whatsoever. Um, many of them are coming from uh, Muslim backgrounds. We've even met Buddhists. We've met uh, people from different uh, tribal uh, and animist religions. And um, it's just been uh, just an incredible thing to work with 
Africans, people from the Middle East, um, so so many different uh, types of people. You know, it's been interesting. Uh, thought maybe I'd tell you a story. We've uh, been able to see the gospel uh, move forward with uh, with some people by going and training uh, some Christians, but then um, helping them uh, and encouraging them to uh, to go on and reproduce some of the things that uh, that we've been teaching them. Um, so uh, so Jesus told uh, his disciples to go out and make disciples, and um, and so what we've been able to see now is. Um, and some of the people that we've trained take those things, go on to uh, other locations, share the gospel. And um, so now we've got uh, Africans sharing with other Africans, Christians sharing with Muslims, um, and the gospel's really going forward, um, whether it's here in Catania, uh, where we've seen uh, some char churches start recently, but also um, even up in Rome and um, some areas around there. Uh, last uh, couple weeks ago, we, we um, trained a, uh, a Muslim form former Muslim guy who's now sharing with um, with his friends um, there in Rome, uh, a Bangladeshi guy. So it's just been amazing to see uh, these baptisms happen and these uh, uh, the, the gospel really just continue to go forward, not just through us, but um, God using the people that um, that we've been able to connect with here. So um, so God's on the move here in, in Catania and um, love to uh, connect with you all uh, to tell you more about it as we as we continue to go forward. And just in closing, uh, we also have an internship program that uh, uh, is uh, receiving uh, candidates even uh, this summer uh, and then in the fall that um, we would be really appreciative if you guys want to really interested and want to uh, see it up close what the ministry is happening. Be, uh, be with Ryan and Gina, wonderful family and the folks here. You know, there's a, there's a possibility for you to join the ministry and um, a worthwhile project for you. Okay, uh, this is all for us in the Mediterranean. Uh, ciao from Vince and from Ryan. <laughs> Talk to you later. Have a good day. So, literally, there's people coming from countries that we can't get into, their missionaries can't get into to share the gospel. They're coming, they're hearing the gospel as they land, and then not only are they hearing the gospel and believing in Jesus, but then they're turning around and they're sharing the gospel with other people other people who are coming uh, all over the place. I mean, how cool is that? And this work is happening. I could have found, uh, I, could have, I could have talked to a whole bunch of other people to get a story just like this in other parts of the world. Guys, you are not alone. The work of the gospel is happening all over and God is moving all over the place. And so listen, develop a habit of listening to these stories of God working in your life to remind yourself that you are not alone. Um, Paul spends the next couple of verses talking about the value of community with other believers. And so if you'll look with me at verses 10 and 11, he says this. He says, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who's called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God. They have proved a comfort to me. And Paul's again communicating to the Colossians that though they may feel alone, there are other believers, even ethnically different believers from a very different part of the world, but who are brothers nonetheless, who remember the Colossians and greet the Colossians as he writes. Um, my freshman year of college was a pretty typical year of college, I think. Uh, it was, I experienced the uh, freedom of college and also uh, it was exciting, it was fun, I gained more than 15 pounds for sure. Uh, I gained quite a bit of weight and I also had this profound sense of loneliness. Um, I mean, it was really fun for the first like month, but then it, you, like this loneliness kind of set in. I think this is pretty normal as I talk to college students, uh, but it was, it was fun to make new friends and all, but it was hard to be away from old friends and family and the people I met didn't know me or care about me in the same way that these old friends did. And, but I remember one day I was feeling particularly lonely. It was one of those days where maybe you've had days like this where you just feel insignificant. You're like, you're just another face in the crowd. And I finished dinner. I went to check my mail and I had gotten a package. And so I hadn't ordered anything. So I, I opened the package real fast and pulled out. I had a, there, inside was just a bag of my favorite homemade cookies and a big Costco sized bag of sour gummy worms, which I told you I gained a lot of weight. And <laughs> Uh, and just a little note, that, and all it said was, thinking about you, love you, love mom and dad. 
And I can't tell you, I mean, that little note, it probably took 15 seconds to scribble out. It was, it was, uh, it wasn't long or profound or anything, but it was really no more than a greeting. But that greeting was such a comfort to my soul that day. And And this is what Paul's talking about here. Jesus gave us the church for a reason. Paul says that these three men have been a comfort to him and that he sent, they send their greetings along to the Colossians. The work of the gospel is hard work. It's lonely work. And it often can be costly work. And and if you try to go out on your own, you will fail. And if you let your brothers and sisters go out on their own, they will fail. And so that's why listening to a sermon online is not the same thing as being in the room, right? That's why we have community groups and men's frat and mops and women's Bible study and life groups for student ministries. And that's why we serve each other on Sunday mornings and and in other places, right? Because like, do you know that there are some kids that are, as kids and students that are upstairs right now, who they are the only Christian that they know at their school, And they're trying to live a life in Christ and they're trying to follow Jesus, but they don't know how and they need an adult or somebody or a friend or something that's not their parent that will help them walk that road. Like there's some, so if you're not like plugged in here, you gotta get plugged in here. You like, and it's fine. If this is your first time, check it out. If it's your second time, check it out, Steve. But once you decide like this is your community, don't just, you can come in here on Sunday and leave and never really be a part of this community. This is a big room, right? And, and so find yourself a smaller community, get plugged in somewhere so that you can actually do, so you can encourage some other folks and be encouraged by some other folks. Because that won't just happen when you're sitting in these rows on Sunday morning. We always say circles are better than rows. So if you get plugged in today, you can go to the hub, you can sign up uh, for a community group or check out some of, our, uh, some of our community group or women's Bible study or MOPS or WBS or um, men's frat or any of the opportunities there. Or you can get signed up for a volunteer orientation on the way out. That's a chance for you just to see what it's like to volunteer, to hear about what the opportunities are and what the opportunity for impact is and where you might fit. You're not signing your life away. It's just a, so you can sign up for that on the way out as well. Um, but next, Paul says that not only should we encourage each other, but we need, to, um, we need to wrestle in prayer for each other as well. So Paul gives the Colossians a great example of someone who's been wrestling in prayer for them, a guy named Epaphras. So if you'll look with me in verses 12 to 15, he says, Epaphras, who's one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus sends his greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Uh, Epaphras was the one who planted the church in Colossae. He had brought the gospel to the city first, but now he had left. He was planting other churches in other parts of the Roman Empire, kind of joined Paul's team, but he hadn't forgotten the Colossians, even though he had left. And so he continued to work hard for them and wrestle in prayer for them. I love that phrase. He's crying out to God that the Colossians would stand firm in their faith. They, They would be mature and fully assured of their salvation. Um, And there's really two takeaways for you in this small section. First, know that you are not alone. You are being prayed for. I'm willing to bet that if you're here in this room, it means someone along the way and maybe still has been praying for you consistently. Uh, That's how you got here. Whether you know it or not, whether you know they were praying for you or not, uh, I'm willing to bet that that's true. And even if that wasn't true, I can tell you that as a staff and as the, and the elders, we pray for you weekly by name when we know your name and the circumstances of your life. And when we don't, we pray for you in general, but we pray every week. And I don't know, you probably don't know this, but before our nine o'clock service, before we even, you all got here, before maybe some of you even woke up, there were a whole bunch of people in this room praying over every single seat. So you were prayed for by someone before you even decided, before you even knew what seat you were gonna sit in, all right? So you've got people praying for you. You are not alone. Um, but second, we've, you've gotta be praying for other people, right? You've gotta be praying for other people. 
uh, and wrestling in prayer, if you're not in the habit of doing this, here's some practical tips. First, you gotta know some people to pray for. But um, when you go home today, or even right now, if you're bored right now, you can do it right now. Make a list of people that you want to pray for and, and start praying for them. Right? Maybe it's family members or coworkers or people that are here or people in your community group or friends, or, but commit to spending a few minutes every night or every morning or sometime to pray for these people. And if your list gets really long, don't feel bad. You can pray for like certain people on some days and other people, you know, just split up your list across days, but spend some time praying for people and not just like a half-hearted God help them. I know they're hurting, help them, but like wrestle in prayer for them. We need each other. And if you're not sure what to pray, you can pray this prayer that, that Epaphras prays for the Colossians, that they would stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. That's a great place to start. But friends, you are not alone. Be, we must be wrestling in prayer for each other. And then finally, Paul concludes his book here, which it brings us to the fifth and final habit, which comes from knowing you are not alone, which is partner with other churches. And so this is how Paul finishes the letter in verses six, starting in verse 16. He says, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. And tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So there was a church down the road in a town called Laodicea that was experiencing this exact same thing as the Colossians. And so Paul says, hey, you read their letter and you give them your letter so you guys can both, you can get kind of the whole report and everything. And so Paul tells them, partner with this other church in, the, in what's happening. And I don't know if you know this, sometimes churches can get really petty and competitive with each other. Uh, I, don't, if, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I like this church. Uh, this church just like owns it. They're like, we're salty and we know it. Uh, I don't, no, they're probably great. It's probably a great church. Uh, they clearly have a sense of humor. But um, no, but, but the reality is we should be for, we should be fighting for any church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we should, we should decide that like, we need more churches, not less churches. Like sometimes people tear here about like, oh, this big, this church is coming to plant here. And they're like, ah, they, you know, they don't, we like get mad about that. But no, we need more churches and we need dying churches to get revitalized by the spirit of God. We, we should be for this, right? Because listen, we started a third service today, which is great. Great, and we got more room for people, and that's great. But I don't care how many services we start. Look around. I don't care how many services we start. I don't care how many plant campuses we plant. We don't have enough chairs. We don't have enough space to reach all the people who are dying without the grace of Christ in their life by ourselves. And so, we, if we want to have a revival type event, we want to have an, we want to have God do something here where the whole peninsula or the whole Bay Area gets transformed by the grace of Christ. We're going to have to partner with other churches. We're going to have to get in community with other churches and do it together. And so this is why as a church, we've invested in church planting and in this area. This is why we've organized church-wide or city-wide worship events and spent time and money and man hours encouraging other churches. And it's why we'll continue to do that. Because if we wanna see the peninsula and the Bay Area actually transform, we're gonna have to partner with other churches to do it, much less the world, right? And just as you are not alone, also we are not alone. And so we, should, we need to partner with other churches. As we, as we come to the end of the book of Colossians, Paul ends as he started, praying for grace to be with us. Because the reality is we're gonna need grace if we wanna establish this brand new life that he's called us to. And one of the many graces that God has given us in this brand new life is each other. And as I was thinking about this week and I was thinking about, you know, it's Easter week and Good Friday is coming and then Easter this weekend. Uh, I was thinking about this scene in the, in the Bible right before Jesus gets arrested. Um, Jesus goes out from the city to a hill just on the out, outside of the city of Jerusalem. And he goes out, he brings three of his closest friends with him. And Jesus is hurting. He is, he is distraught and broken inside. It's, his soul is, is just hurt. And um, he wants to go out and pray, but he's got people who are coming to try to kill him. And he knows this. And so he brings his three friends with him basically as, 
as guards, as, as watchmen. So they come out with him and they're supposed to keep watch so he can go and pray in peace and then they'll warn him if anyone is coming. And so Jesus can focus on his prayer. And so he brings them out and he says, you guys stay here and watch and I'm gonna go pray. And so he does. And he, and he pr- goes out and prays for a little while and he comes back to check on his friends and he finds they're all asleep. And so he wakes them up and he, and he begs them, guys, you've got to stay awake. Like people are coming to kill me. You've got to stay awake. I, got, I, I need this time in prayer. And so he, he goes away and he starts praying again and comes back and they're asleep again. And then he wakes them up again. And he implores them, guys, you've got to stay awake. You've got to, you've got to keep watch for me. And he goes back to pray. And, and, and after he prays, he comes back again. And uh, and he finds them and they're asleep again a third time. And it's at this moment that Jesus submits to the reality, this devastating reality, that he has to do what he's come here to do alone. Jesus went to the cross and when he did, he not only suffered the pain and the punishment that you, you and I deserved, but he also suffered he also experienced the abandonment and the loneliness that you and I deserve, right? On the cross, Jesus hung utterly alone, crying out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? Jesus experienced the full anguish of being completely alone so that you never have to be. He hung on the cross by himself so that he could say after his resurrection, I will be with you always. He died absolutely forsaken so that you could live in community with the church. So friends, you are not alone. You are not alone. Live your brand new life boldly in Christ and live it together. We're gonna, we're gonna remind ourselves of this, that we're not alone by uh, doing something a little different. We're gonna take communion, which we often do here, um, but we're gonna do it a little bit in a little bit different way. Often when we take communion, we get the elements and we kind of turn the lights down. You can't see each other and, and we pray kind of by ourselves and, and, and reflect on the cross of Christ in our lives. And that's great. That's a great way to do communion. That's the way we normally do it here. We're gonna do it a little differently. In a moment here, I'm gonna actually right now, I'm gonna invite the band back out and I'm gonna invite the ushers forward and they're gonna pass out the elements um, for communion. And when you get the elements, instead of normally taking them, we usually take them when you're ready. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to hold on to them. And we're going to sing this song together. And then I'm going to pop back up here and we're going to take the elements all together as a church, as one body of believers. And so um, as we do this, uh, if, if you don't know what communion is about or you're kind of new to this church thing, that's fine. Uh, if you, This is really an opportunity for us as Christians to remember what Christ has done for us on the cross, the sacrifice he made for us, as well as to look forward to this day when he's gonna come back and we're all gonna have a huge party and a big old meal together. And so if you're not a believer, don't feel like you need to participate in this. Um, really, this is, this is a meal and a celebration for us as believers. But uh, if you are, please take and eat and celebrate with us. And I'll be back in a minute to do this together.